the book of Joel. This little book of three chapters has been referred to as one of the literary gems of the Old Testament. Its message is that kind which has the tendency to shake the reader from his state of lethargy. It's disturbing and heart-searching, to say the least. And here, beloved, you're going to see the climax of world history reaching its highest and decisive point of judgment at the coming again of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Joel, you're going to read of the doom of wicked nations when God vindicates his holiness and righteousness in the earth. W. G. Elmsley wrote in the Expositor, the fourth series, these words. He said, if there is a book in the Bible that is a masterpiece of literary art, it is the book of Joel. There are other prophets who write with greater passion and greater power and who rise to loftier altitudes of divine revelation, but there is hardly a writer in the Old Testament who shows proof of so careful and detailed and exquisite pains to give his work literary polish and finish and beauty. Of all the books in the Bible, I'm recommending this one uh, as a prophetic study as to what God plans to do in the last days. Now, of the man Joel, uh, which means Jehovah is God, we know very little. And make a note of the meaning of the name. This is important. Old Testament names, the meanings are most significant. Joel means Jehovah is God. We don't know very much about this man. The name Joel was possibly common in Old Testament times, and I'm saying this because there are no less than 11 persons in the Bible with the name of Joel. The penman of, of the book that, that bears his name, the book we're studying, was the son of Pethuel, Joel 1.1, the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. But inasmuch as this is the only appearance of Pethuel in the Bible, it doesn't shed a bit of light on the man Joel. Now, this lack of information about Joel ought not to disturb us. There is obscurity attached to other writers of Holy Scripture. What does, uh, does it matter if, uh, if, if we don't know anything about the man? Uh, these men were God's chosen vessels through whom he transmitted his word. That's all we need to know. Now, we do know that God spoke in time past unto the Holy Fathers by the prophets, Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. And Peter said in his second epistle, chapter 1 and verse 21, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now, Joel was one of those prophets. And what he gave to the world in his brief message is the inspired, inerrant, immutable, imperishable, invincible word of the living God. Joel's message has existed now for 2,800 years, and it is going to continue forever. What does it matter if we do not know the details about Joel, as long as we know the God who inspired Joel to write this literary gem? Now, there's likewise a note of uncertainty as to the date that this book was written. If Joel was one of the earliest of the writing prophets preceding Hosea and Amos, he possibly prophesied and wrote, well, I'm not going to be dogmatic, but we're going to give an approximate time of the writing of this man. And, 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 and we're not going to be dogmatic about it because we do not know for certain. But I'd say between 860 and 820 B.C. Now, we do know that Joel prophesied and wrote to the southern kingdom of Judah when Joash was its young king. So that gives me a little time element here, sometime between 860 and 820 before Christ. Five times in the book of Joel, there appears the phrase, the day of the Lord. Now, your Bible is open, and I would like you to take your ballpoint pen and please note these appearances of that term, the day of the Lord. This is the key phrase. This will unlock the door into the storehouse of truth that will give to you the pith and the point of this little book. Look, note verse 15 of chapter 1. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. Chapter 2, verse 1. Have your ballpoint pen ready. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, 
and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh. Mark in your Bible the day of the Lord. Move over to verse 11 of chapter 2. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great. For he is strong that executeth his word, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? Mark in your Bible that term, the day of the Lord. And then move over to verse 31 of that same second chapter. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. Underline day of the Lord and look at chapter 3, verse 14. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Now here is a key to our understanding of the message of Joah. This phrase occurs not less than 30 times in the Old Testament and four times in the New Testament. And you'll find it in verses such as Isaiah chapter 2, verse 12, Isaiah chapter 13, verses 6 and 9, Jeremiah chapter 46, verse 10, Ezekiel chapter 13, verse 5. And when we come to the book of Amos, you'll find it there. So that it is the very heart of Joel's message. In fact, Joel is known as the prophet of the day of Jehovah or the day of the Lord. And you will notice that the word Lord in these verses that I pointed out is spelled in all capital letters. And, of course, that is the self-existent Jehovah. Now, the day of the Lord is associated with God's judgment against sin and against sinners. Now, it's not limited to any one 24-hour day, but it could apply to any day or any period of time when God avenges sin and punishes the sinner. Now, prophetically, the day of the Lord looks ahead to the time when God will finally vindicate his righteousness and his holiness in the earth. The descriptions of that day are linked with dread. Joel sees it first. Notice chapter 1, verse 15 again, as a day of destruction. Mark that in your Bible, a day of destruction. Look at chapter 2 and verse 2. There it is called a day of darkness. Over in chapter 2, verse 11, look at that, those descriptive terms. There it is a day of distress and difficulty. Over in chapter 3 and verse 14, it is a day of decision. Now, the day of the Lord is necessary, has to come to pass for the purging of the earth before peace and righteousness can reign in the messianic kingdom. In that day, the scales of justice will finally balance. I will examine this more closely in our exposition of the text. Now, I want to just say a word about a comment that a friend of mine made concerning the book of Joel, a fine Bible teacher. He suggested three of the more common views as to when the day of the Lord will begin. Now, we're speaking about the prophetic day of the Lord, that future day when God comes to vindicate his righteousness and judgment in the earth. First of all, there is the suggestion that it occurs at the rapture when the tribulation period begins. Then there are those who believe that it starts after the rapture, sometime during the tribulation, possibly midway through the tribulation. And then there are those who believe that the day of the Lord begins at the revelation or at Christ's return to the earth after the tribulation, when Christ defeats his foes at the conflict of Armageddon. Now, we're going to discuss this as we pursue our study, so let's not be too anxious now as to getting concerned about all of the details concerning the day of the Lord. Let's begin now with the text and look, first of all, at a plague that obviously existed in Joel's day or in the day that Joel wrote. Look now at verse 2. Hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land, Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your father? Now, verse 2 opens with a vivid description of a literal plague of locusts. It's a rather dramatic and devastating scene, unlike anything in Joel's book. Some idea of the seriousness of that calamity can be deduced from Joel's opening remarks. Hear this, ye old man. 
and give ear all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days or even in the days of your fathers? This brief but solemn appeal indicates the magnitude of the disaster. Its fearful nature had no precedent in the memory of the oldest person then living, nor even in the days of their ancestors. Now that's what verse 2 is saying. Do you or your ancestors ever recall a time when a plague like this ever visited the earth? You see, it was a judgment God wanted his people to remember in the future. In verse 3, he says, Tell your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. In other words, Joe was saying, as the Holy Spirit directs him, coming generations are to hear of this devastating judgment from God and learn the necessary lessons from it. Now, this always has been a method that God has used to warn future generations that judgment upon the earth is inevitable. There are some significant passages. For example, I think you will find one in Exodus chapter 10. I'm turning in my Bible to Exodus 10, and perhaps you can do the same thing. In Exodus chapter 10 and verse 2, we read, Verse 1 says, The Lord said unto Moses, Go in unto Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I might show these my signs before him, that thou mayest tell in the ears of thy son and of thy son's son what things I have wrought in Egypt, and my signs which I have done among them, that ye may know how that I am the Lord. Now, though I'm jumping ahead a bit right here, I'm constrained to inject a thought which comes to my mind about the future day of the Lord. I'm thinking of our Lord's description of the coming great tribulation after the church has been removed from earth to heaven. Our Lord said in Matthew 24, 21, For then shall be great tribulation. Think of that. Such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be. Recently, a well-known evangelist, and if I were to mention his name, I'm sure every hearer of this broadcast would know this name. He said he believed that we might be presently entering the tribulation. Well, dear friends, I believe he's wrong. When that future day of the Lord strikes the earth, there will be nothing in history with which to compare it. And what we are experiencing now has been duplicated in the past so that the worst is yet to come. God has not avenged sin, nor has he fully and completely vindicated his holiness and his righteousness among men. Remember what the Lord Jesus said. There shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be. Now, verse 4 contains a description of the plague of locusts. That which the palmer worm hath left hath the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath left hath the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm hath left hath the caterpillar eaten. Now this fourth verse is not the easiest verse in the book to interpret. There are three different viewpoints that have been suggested, and all three seem to have some possibilities. First, they are those Bible teachers, conservative men, who believe there are four different kinds of locusts. And then there are those who believe that the locust passes through four stages of development. They believe that's suggested in verse 4. Then there are those Bible teachers who hold that there were four successive swarms of locusts. And what one swarm did not devour, the succeeding ones did. The late Dr. A.C. Gabeline favors the second view that the locust passes through four stages, the fourth being the most destructive and devouring stage. Now, this view has some support uh, in an article published in National Geographic magazine way back in December 1915. Now, whether or not one agrees with this view, it does support Joel's description of the destruction uh, or the destructive power of the locust. Dr. Charles Feinberg and Dr. J. Vernon McGee, contemporaries who support the third view, that there were four successive swarms of locusts, and what one did not consume, the following did. Dr. McGee looks ahead to the day of the Lord in the Great Tribulation, when the four horsemen appear in succession, 
the first offering a false peace followed by war, famine, and death, Revelation chapter 6. Well, whether he's right or not, I'm not here to say. The earth will be totally devastated in that day called by John the great day of Christ's wrath, Revelation 6:17. Now, this much we know. However you interpret these uh, four descriptive terms here in verse 4 of Joel chapter 1, this much we know, that there is a future day coming when devastation and destruction and death will come to the human race in a way unprecedented in history. Now let's move from the plague to the plight in verses 5 through 7. Now in these verses we see the sad state of affairs existing at the time of the plague. The drunkards are the first to be called to task. Verse 5, Awake ye drunkards and weep, and howl all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. Now, as we read the books of the prophets, it is quite evident that drunkenness was a common sin among the ancient Jews as well as among the Gentiles. And this doubtless was one uh, a major cause of the downfall of the nation of Israel. The prophet Isaiah was directed by God to speak out against this prevailing evil. Uh, in chapter 5 and verse 11, we read, Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night, till wine inflame them. And again, again Isaiah 5.22, Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine, and men of strength to mingle strong drink. Isaiah 24, 9, strong drink shall be bitter to them that drink it. And again in Isaiah chapter 28, beginning with verse 7, but they also have erred through wine and through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. For all tables are full of the vomit and the filthiness so that there is no clean place. And when you come to the prophet Amos, he also has some things to say. Amos chapters 2, 4, and 6, and we'll come to that later. Habakkuk was told by God to sound the same warning. Woe unto them that giveth his neighbor drink, that putteth a bottle to him, and makest him drunken also, that thou may, mayest look on their nakedness. Habakkuk 2.15. Now the first mention of drunkenness in the Bible resulted in a calamity. And that goes back to Noah in Genesis chapter 9. So the Old Testament is really loaded with comments condemning alcoholic beverage. Now, the New Testament is equally strong in its denunciation of the evil of drunkenness. For example, Ephesians 5.18, Be not drunk with wine, but Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, Don't be drunk with wine. Now, the offense is so serious in God's sight, he has warned that drunkards shall not inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 6.10 Christians are told they must not associate with a drunkard. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 11. Drunkenness is classified as being indecent. Romans 13 verse 13. You see, beloved, the language of Scripture is plain and understandable to us all. The Bible never calls a person an alcoholic, always a drunkard. Our modern society says that drunkenness is a disease. Come on, now, you don't believe that. God calls it sin. Drunkenness is not a contagious virus. You don't catch it by standing too close or sitting too close with someone who is a drunkard. If it were a disease, God would not punish drunkards. God punishes sin. God doesn't punish sickness. Drunkenness is the one sin that Joel mentions. It was the evil of that day. Now in verse 6, the locusts are compared to an invading army. For a nation has come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. God likens the swarm of locusts to a nation coming from him as a judgment. Some commentators conclude from this verse that the locust plague was not a literal one. However, I see nothing here to support such a conclusion. The language Joel uses is not uncommon in the Bible. Answer called the people. We read in Proverbs 30, verse 25, the ants are a people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. 
I can find no reason to spiritualize or allegorize the locusts in Joel chapter 1. A locust plague sent by God as a judgment was no new thing. Go back to Exodus chapter 10, beginning with verse 12. And there you read the story as to how the Israelites knew that that plague of locusts, uh, uh, that devouring plague was sent by God to the Egyptians. An impressive metaphor is used in describing the teeth of the locust as being like those of a lion and a lioness. You see that in verse 6? You see their saw-like teeth begins chomping at the leaves of the vines and the trees, and they don't stop until they have devoured the bark, leaving the trunk and the branches white and bare. For example, look at verse 7. He hath laid my vine waste and barked my fig tree, that is, eaten all the bark. He hath made it clean bare and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. So you see, the locust had gotten to the grapes first, stripping the vineyards, thereby depriving the wine drinkers of the grapes. The locust did not have lion's teeth, but as destructive as are the teeth of a lion in the animal kingdom, so destructive are the teeth of locusts to vegetation. So Joel begins by bringing to light this judgment that God sent upon the children of Israel, and the reasons are obvious. Now that's as far as we're going in verses 1 through 7. And in conclusion, I want to remind you, beloved, that God hates and judges sin. This is the whole message of the book of Joel. The day of the Lord is a day when God avenges his holiness, when God judges sin and the sinner. He has to do it because of who God is. Now, it could be any day. In fact, the day of the Lord could be today in the life of any individual. But Joel is speaking prophetically of a coming day when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back to earth again and vindicates the holiness and the righteousness of God in the judgment of sin. Now, in verses 1 through 7, we saw something of the plague of locusts. We saw the reason for that plague. There had been excessive drinking of alcoholic beverage, according to verse 5. And God begins his judgment upon the drinkers, the drunkards. I made mention of the fact that the Bible never refers to these people as alcoholics, nor does it ever infer that the so-called alcoholism is a disease. They're always called drunkards, and they are always under the judgment and the condemnation of God. Now, beloved friends, I'm not apologizing for teaching you what the Bible says. I believe that one of the severest blights on our whole society today is this blight of alcoholic beverage, drunkenness among our people. We are told by insurance companies that approximately 50% of the 50,000 people killed on the highways of America every year are killed as the result of people drinking alcoholic beverage, drunk drivers. And we should get these murderers off the highway. We should deal with them. And our judges should be passing severe sentences on these people. Now, something should be done about it. Now, I want to sound a warning to you. If you are someone involved in social drinking, you are a potential drunkard. Now, don't misquote me. I want to repeat it so you don't misquote me. I did not say you are a drunkard. I said you are a potential drunkard. Every drunkard today began by taking a social drink. You ask any drunkard today if when he started to drink, if his goal was to become a drunkard. Of course it was not. He took it as a social drink, either on a dare or he wanted to uh, keep up with his peers and uh, or to go along with the social class that he was involved in. There are many reasons why people start to drink, but I can guarantee you, my friend, that you will never become a drunkard if you will do one thing. Don't take the first drink. Now, you can do without it. Get something else. If you have a stomach problem, go to your doctor. You don't need to get hooked on booze. Now, that's the judgment, the cause of the judgment in verses 1 through 7. Now, beginning with verse 8, there is a plea that is sounded. And passing from the plight of the wine drinkers, Joel calls upon the spiritual leaders to lament and to mourn. Verse 8, lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. 
Now the people are called upon to mourn, as would a new bride whose husband had died, possibly killed in battle. Both the wine and the fig tree are mentioned in Scripture as a type of Israel. In the 80th Psalm, beginning with verse 8 and going through 15, in Isaiah chapter 5, beginning with verse 2 and going through verse 6, Israel is typified by the vine. Now you can see many other verses in Scripture where Israel is typified by the fig tree. Matthew chapter 21, verses 17 through 21. Matthew 24, verses 32 and 33. Luke 13, verses 6 through 10. Here Israel is typified by the fig tree. So the vine and the fig tree have been laid bare in judgment, and God is calling upon the nation to weep and mourn for her sins, which occasioned the punishment, the plague set forth by the locusts in verses 1 through 7. The disaster and the losses were so great as to call for such grief. God's saying you ought to stop everything and get on your knees and weep and mourn and lament and repent of your sins. So far-reaching was the disaster which had come upon the land that the religious life of the people was affected. Look at verses 9 and 10. The meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests, the Lord's ministers, mourn. The field is wasted, the land mourneth. For the corn is wasted, the new wine is dried up, the oil languisheth. Verses 9 and 10. You see, the priests, the Lord's ministers, are called upon to mourn here in verse 9. Both the people and the land were seriously affected. And so the plea to mourn and repent was spoken to all classes. Notice to drunkards, then to priests, then to the husbandmen. Now the husbandmen, of course, are the farmers. He says, awake, lament, mourn, be ashamed. You see, all of them were helpless. Thus God was calling to all people to repent. It was not the wrecked economy that was God's great concern, but the wicked hearts of the people. Both the land and the people were God's. He calls them my vine, my fig tree. Have you noticed that in verse 7? He hath laid my vine waste and barked my fig tree. More than 100 times in the Old Testament, God refers to Israel as my people. Now you will notice that here in the book of Joel. For example, we look at chapter 2 and verse 26. What do you read there? Ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, that hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. See that? My people. Again in verse 27. Ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. Look at chapter 3 in verse 2. There they are called my people. And again in verse 3, my people. God would care for and control his land, but his people were creatures of choice and were therefore responsible for their sins. God brought the affliction upon the land as a visitation of judgment, a chastisement upon his people, but with meaning and purpose. Beloved, all of the judgments of God have meaning and purpose behind them. God never makes a mistake. God never makes a wrong judgment. God never chastises unless that chastisement is needed. We human parents sometimes err. We become, we're controlled by our emotions or by a, a, an anger or by a child who disobeyed us. And sometimes we punish them unjustly. We make unjust demands upon them, but God never does that. All of the judgments of God are right. And God has one desire, and that desire is to rescue his people from their sinful ways and restore them to blessing and prosperity. There is always a good purpose behind the judgments of God. And just as all of the trees of the field are withered, so all the joy is gone from the children of men. Verses 11 and 12. Look at it. Be ye ashamed, O ye husbandmen, howl, O ye vine dressers, for the wheat and for the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished. Now that's bad enough. When God sends a, a plague upon a nation and there's a shortage of food. Beloved, God could make us, bring us to our knees in absolute poverty and without food by one little stroke of his mighty hand. 
You see, God can judge the earth, and we could have no grain, no crops. God can send a drought to dry up this land. One summer would put us all behind the eight ball as far as food is concerned. Now, that's bad enough in verse 11, but look at verse 12. The vine is dried up, the fig tree languisheth, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree, even all the trees of the field are withered. Why? Watch this. Joy is withered away from the sons of men. See, it's bad enough, dear friends, when God sends a plague and there's a shortage of food. But oh, when the joy of the Lord leaves the hearts of people, when sin enters the life of a child of God, the joy of the Lord is gone. In that well-known penitential prayer, David prayed in Psalm 51, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. When David sinned, he did not lose his salvation, but he surely did lose his joy. You see, beloved Christians stripped of their joy are to be pitied. And so now God is calling to his people to awake, to lament. He's calling upon them to mourn and be ashamed because of their sins. And he said, if you do, I'll restore the joy that has withered away. Now, joy means gladness, and it's closely related to worship. Have you ever thought of that? For example, Psalm 35, 9. My soul shall be joyful in the Lord. It shall rejoice in his salvation. Psalm 63, 5. My mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. Psalm 66, 1. Make a joyful noise unto God, all ye lands. Psalm 81, 1. Make a joyful noise unto the God of Jacob. Psalm 95, 1. Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. You see, friends, when our hearts are right with God, joy accompanies our worship of Him. Many of you know that it is my privilege and responsibility to travel around this country. I have preached in 48 of the 50 states in the Union. I've been in almost 1,200 different churches on the North American continent, preaching and teaching the Word of God in the last 43 years. And I want to say to you, dear people, I look into the faces of hundreds and hundreds of people week after week after week, going through the motions of worship, singing the songs, listening to the sermon, listening to the music, putting their offerings in the plate or in the basket, but the joy of the Lord has departed from them. You see, wherever you have real worship, you always have joy, not a happiness that's brought on by an abundance of this world's goods, but genuine joy, the joy of the Lord. Now look at verse 13. God says, Gird yourselves and lament, ye priests, howl, ye ministers of the altar. Come, lie all night in sackcloth, ye ministers of my God. For the meat offering and the drink offering is withholden from the house of your God. You see, the Holy Spirit, speaking through Joel, now gives specific instructions as to what the people must do if the blessing of the Lord is to return. The priest had been unable to perform regular duties. Why? There was no provision for the meal and the drink offerings. There was no grain the locust had come and devoured all the grain, and there was no way of producing food and drink for the offerings to be given to the Lord. Joel said that they were being withheld from the house of the Lord because of the absence of grain and fruits. There was not enough to provide an offering to God. You know, at this point, I'm going to insert a brief but a blessed word from the pen of a man whom I believe is dead now. I haven't heard about him, but Harold P. Barker was an Englishman and a very helpful uh, Bible student and a, a writer of some helpful books. On one occasion he said this, and I'm quoting, he said, the meal and drink offerings spoke of Christ, and now they had ceased. As God looked down from heaven, there was no longer anything in Judah that presented Christ typically to God's eye. Well, what does God see when he looks down upon our nation today? Does he see genuine joy from converted hearts? Does he see the behavior that commends us to the world as being the children of God? You see, the priests were to wear garments of mourning. They were to grieve because of the sin in the land. Why the priests? Well, they were the spiritual leaders. 
and the spiritual leaders must take the initiative in this, and thereby set before others an example of true and genuine repentance. Have you noticed the word sackcloth? You find it there in verse 8. You see it in verse 8 and again in verse 13. That word sackcloth means a loose garment woven from goats or from camel's hair, and it was always worn to express mourning or penitence or sorrow for misbehavior. The instructions in the plea were clearly understood by the priest. They knew what they meant. You see, self-judgment must begin at the house of God in the hearts of the spiritual leaders. Let there be no question about that. First Peter chapter 4 and verse 17 said that judgment must begin at the house of God. Those in, in the place of leadership must remove their priestly garments and put on the garment of mourning. They were to engage in an all-night session of confession and prayer. And I think this is where it has to begin. We have preachers today who preach great truths, but they don't live it. We have men today who preach right, but they don't behave right. They preach good sermons on morality, but they are guilty of immorality. I could name you, I can name you ten ministers, many of them well-known, some of them well-known, who have divorced their wives in the last 15 to 18 months. I can rattle the names off. I know every one of them. And there are men who preach about honesty, but who are dishonest in their dealings with their fellow men. This is not right. And so Joel's calling upon the spiritual leaders of the nation. Now God's going to request something of the people that he had never asked before. You'll find it in verse 14. He said, Sanctify ye a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God, and cry unto the Lord. In other words, they were... These, these people and the priests were to uh, call together what he calls solemn assemblies. Now, what is a solemn assembly? Well, uh, in the life of the nation, uh, these were feast days when the people came together and they, they celebrated these great feast days as unto the Lord. But here's to be a fast day. Uh, for an interesting study in this, you can turn to the seven feasts in Leviticus chapter 23. But here Joel is instructed to call the people together for a time of fasting and prayer, not feasting. The gathering together was not for the purpose of rejoicing, for their joy had withered away from them. We saw that in verse 12. There was no joy. There can be no genuine joy in the heart of a believing, uh, of a sinner who's living, a Christian who's living in sin. If you are a child of God today and you're living in disobedience to the Word of God, you know I'm telling you the truth when I tell you there can be no genuine joy in your heart. There's a lack of peace. There's a lack of quiet. Why? Because you are disobeying God and there's turmoil and disturbance within you. Now, here in verse 14, it's to be a solemn assembly. It's to be a time to go to church for the express purpose of getting their hearts right with God. That's the main thrust of this whole appeal here. And uh, it's interesting to notice how it says all the inhabitants of the land were to come, male and female, young and old, saved and unsaved, the carnal and the spiritual. The people are being reminded that the locust plague was an act of God because of their sins and should therefore be the occasion for national mourning and national repentance. You know, it's interesting to observe that there's no record here in chapter 1 of any response from the people. As the chapter ends, one person only is in prayer, and that's Joel. He alone is crying to God. And it seems for the present that the plea in verse 14 went unheeded. The failure of the people to respond to God's call prepared the way for the prophecy which followed. What was the prophecy? The coming day of the Lord. That prophecy begins with verse 15. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. As a destruction from the Almighty, it shall come. Why must it come? Because there was no response in the hearts of the people to the call to gather together for repentance. I believe that if America were to heed the call of God and get back to putting first things first. And what are first things? 
the word of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. If our nation were to turn to God, not a sham turning, but a genuine repentance, I believe that God would pour out upon our land his blessing. Now, I am not saying that the Bible teaches a coming worldwide conversion before the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. I cannot find anything in Scripture to support that teaching. But I am not saying it is not possible for a revival to come before the return of Christ. It is not only possible, it is probable. And I believe it all depends on us. If we Americans were willing to repent of our sins and level with God, level with our spouses, level with our fellow Christians, level with those with whom we do business, if we were genuinely honest in our dealings with God and man, I believe that God would bring to this nation unprecedented blessing. We are in for one of two things, either the blessing of God or the judgment of God. And the tragedy here in chapter 1 is that we see no evidence of the people responding to the call of the prophet Joel. Now, Joel's not cooking up a sermon. This book is divinely inspired of God. Joel is simply passing on to the people the preachments of God, the message of God, the precepts of God. He's telling the people what God told him to tell them. It's a message direct from the Lord. Now, I believe that national repentance is a matter of the heart of individuals. I don't know how you can have a national repentance unless it starts in somebody's heart. It has to begin with individuals. The nation is made up of people, individual people. And I'm saying if enough individuals were to come before God and confess their sins and forsake their sins, if enough individuals were to do this, I believe that that would spread in our nation. But there's so much phonyism, so much unreality, even among Christians. Oh, beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders, gather the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God, and cry unto the Lord. That's the appeal in verse 14. It comes from the prophet to the nation to the people who belonged to God. May God help us to see the importance of this matter.